This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, and Rodrigo Smith Zapata. Coming up on DTNS, YouTubers are under attack. The FTC wants to crack down on those subscriptions you just can't cancel. And Trisha Hershberger joins us to fill you in on all things GDC. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Strappolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us is Trisha Hirschberger, TV host and streamer, and all around great person. Trisha, thanks for being with us again. <laughs> Thank you, all around great person, Sarah Lane. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> well, we're excited to have you. We're going to be talking about GDC a little bit later in the show. But first, let's start with the quick hits. Bloomberg sources say that Apple plans to spend $1 billion per year to expand its original films division. This would focus on blockbuster titles with wide th th theatrical releases before coming to Apple TV+. The plan would be to put movies in thousands of theaters at least a month ahead of coming to streaming. The company also reportedly plans to partner with studios to handle international distribution. But Bloomberg sources also say Apple's considering bidding for the rights to stream English football games, including Premier League and English Football League matches. This comes after Apple entered into a 10-year deal to broadcast Major League Soccer matches last year. Microsoft released a public preview of Loop, its new collaborative work app on the web, Android, and iOS. The app supports live updating components that can be dropped into other Microsoft 365 apps. So if you update it in Loop, it would update in those other apps. It also supports things like task assignments, project tracking, and just other task management features as well. Mobile apps are limited to work accounts right now, but you can try out the web app uh, as long as you have a Microsoft account. We have a lot of releases today. WhatsApp released a new Windows client supporting multi-device sync so you can use it without needing your phone. It can also host video calls up to eight people and audio calls up to 32 people. Future plans will increase those limits going forward. Nothing officially announced something, namely its $149 Ear 2 wireless earbuds. Compared to the Ear 1, which was Nothing's first product release, these are slightly taller and lighter with the more durable plastic, IP54 rated, and The Verge's John Porter found that they offered noticeable improvements in sound quality and noise cancellation. The buds replace tap controls with earbud stem squeezing. Using the Nothing X app, users can personalize noise cancellation and equalization based on their hearing. The buds can also connect up to two devices at once. Snap announced AR Enterprise Services, which will offer its augmented reality filters to businesses directly integrated into their apps. This includes AR virtual try-ons, a 3D viewer to see objects at different angles, and a fit and sizing recommendation based on your body scan. Snap will also help clients customize filters and provide performance analytics. All right, Rich, let's talk about what's happening on YouTube. Yeah, well, I, I don't think this is breaking news here, but the YouTube channel Linus Tech Tips, pretty popular, right? Audience of 15.3 million, even if you're not subscribed. If you're watching this show, you've probably seen it in your YouTube suggestions every once in a while. Uh, it did throw a big spy line on it, that big profile, when it was taken over on the morning of March 23rd. The attackers put up several live video broadcasts related to crypto-related scams and making some older private videos public. Ooh. The attackers also also breached other channels in the Linus Media Group, including Tech Quickie and Tech Linked. YouTube, though, eventually suspended the accounts. It wasn't much of a long takeover. Yeah, so if you're saying, well, this is bad, it's not the first high-profile breach to hit YouTube recently. Last year, you might recall that the British Army's YouTube account was also hacked to push a crypto scam and also saw unauthorized videos uploaded to several popular Vivo channels. It's unclear if there's a consistent way that accounts are being breached. Is it one stop shop or are they just getting creative here? Some YouTubers say that this comes from fake sponsors reaching out to channels, then using malware in emails to steal cookies to then hijack accounts. 
Yeah, and this doesn't appear just to be like anecdotal just because these are high profile accounts. Earlier this month, security researchers at CloudSec found that since November, it's seen a 200 to 300% month on month increase in YouTube videos with links to info stealing malware in video descriptions. And these are often spread through account takeovers, generally not quite as high profile, but uh, definitely is seeing a big uptick here. So, you know, uh, you know, Trisha, I'm, I'm curious, what can, I guess, YouTube do to combat these takeovers? And have you seen this kind of out in the wild? Um, I wish I knew the answer to what YouTube could do to combat this. I mean, increased security is always a positive thing, but I think YouTube has a pretty good lock on that at the moment. But have I seen this kind of thing before? Absolutely. I have countless creator friends who have had their YouTube accounts hacked before. I mean, the, the hardest thing is when it's not a channel as large as Linus Tech Tips, when it's mm -hmm. a more mid-range or even smaller channel because you don't have access to someone directly at YouTube to suspend the account so that no more harm can be done or to regain access to your channel. And I've seen some creators just lose it completely and have to start all over fresh. Um, so it's one of the reasons why whenever I'm having this discourse with other people who create media to place on the internet somewhere um, that I'm a big fan of diversifying as much as possible. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because if that basket goes the way of Vine, for example, uh, you'd be very sad. So I, this is, it's sad that it happened to Linus Tech Tips. I hope that they're able to get their channel back and reinstated as soon as possible, not only for them as creators, but also for all the people that are looking forward to their content. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, when you're talking about the smaller players in this in the space, Trisha, that really resonates with me. For example, if someone I know, well, if someone I know really well seems to have gotten hacked, then I, you know, <laughs> message them and say, you might want to look at your feed. Um, but if I'm a uh, you know a, you know a curious or even enthusiastic uh, 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 audience member of a kind of mid-range YouTube channel. I mean, Linus Tech Tips is, has over 15 million subscribers, so you're gonna guess that a lot of those people are not only tech savvy, but realize, well, they're not gonna do something crazy like a crypto scam, something, something has happened. But if I were to, I don't know, come across a channel that I'm like, this is pretty cool. You know, I don't really know, you know, what they're all about. I don't really know, you know, their ethos behind the scenes. And something like this happens, you go, mm, messy, I don't, yeah, I don't want to be there anymore. And that's where I feel like the that kind of middle ground creator really loses because you just get people who don't trust you through no fault of your own. Well, and a lot of times what will happen in these type of, of account takeover scams and some of the other Linus uh, uh, channels uh, saw this is the attackers will rename the channel. So they'll take advantage of the mm -hmm. fact that they already have a massive subscriber base and they're usually pushed up to the top of feeds and stuff like that. They'll rename it to something, you know, vaguely either. Uh, I, Tesla was the example in this, like Tesla related, but something crypto related uh, in a lot of other situations. And so they will use that and, and use like SEO poisoning techniques to basically get to the top of feeds, get a ton of clicks super quickly in the hopes that a Eventually, they get some kind of click through or scam through for their uh, for their scams and stuff like that. I, I think one of the things that uh, the CloudSec report also pointed out that I think is interesting is one of the ways you combat this, right, is if they're uploading these same videos, right? If it's like an organized campaign and they're uploading these same scam videos, mm -hmm. uh, you could eventually hash those, right? The, the same thing that they're doing to combat like CSAM or something like that. So you can just tell at the point of upload, this is a, a trash video. We don't want it. It's a scam video. Uh, deny the upload. What CloudSec found was also that, and I didn't have any hard numbers on this, but they were saying they were also seeing an increased number in people using AI-generated content from companies like DID, I believe was uh, one of the ones that they cited on there. Not like wholesale, but using like uh, uh, AI-generated avatars and stuff like that to kind of do the presentation. And that allows these organizations to iterate on these videos much quicker so that technically they're all original. You're not going to see that same kind of hashing response. It makes it harder for YouTube. I do think one of the things that YouTube might be able to do for this, and uh, The Verge uh, pointed this out in its coverage as well, is it seems like it's very much a, like, uh, it, it has a very old school approach to account security, right? Where it's like avoiding people getting into your account, but once they're in there, they kind of have full reign of the, mm -hmm. the kingdom to rename channels and stuff like that. And for big name channels, the ability to say, listen, no matter what, I either want to have like another trusted contact uh, in the loop if I change the name of my channel or have a second, you know, have another multi-factor authentication scheme on top of like just account access to do these kind of high level things. I think it would be, uh, you know, it, it seems like just giving you a, a lot of security tools to prevent access 
isn't getting the job done when you're having threat actors that are intercepting cookies that are you know getting malware on your machine and once they do that they can do they they can you know cause a lot of trouble um it's like you you almost have to it's a, a you know a term in security is micro segment kind of the damage that they can do with one actor with access assume that they are going to have access and then uh you know kind of plan your security in there admittedly youtube is a giant target so whatever they do it's not going to stop you know the threat actors will adapt for whatever changes they make based on this but definitely a big flag with linus tech tips going down also i think that would be super helpful uh, oh, go ahead trish yeah yeah I, rich what you suggested i think would be super super helpful um and i've also seen people get in there get into another account and just just be malicious not even trying to scam yeah. people out of money just deleting vast Stealing libraries things. of content archives mm -hmm. it's too much sarah what were you gonna say love well, it, along the same vein, the whole idea, good reminder, um, obviously, <laughs> you know, it, it, none of us um, want to, you know, be fished or in any way be hacked. But if you do have private videos or photos stored anywhere, you know, you may kind of think of that as like, well, it's sort of like a cloud, right? I mean, no one can see it anyway. And, you know, I can go in there and, and, and do whatever with that content when I want to. This, uh, I don't have anything on YouTube. I, I, I'm merely a consumer. Um, I really don't post anything on YouTube. On Flickr back in the day though, I had countless, well I still do, have count, uh, like private uh, photo albums. They're not salacious at all, but there's stuff where I'm like, eh, you know, these aren't even really good photos. I didn't have good captions. It's basically my photo storage. And because I, Flickr has changed so much over time, you know, I still haven't gone in and taken some of those photos out of there. And if someone were to say, hmm, we'll make this all public, that would be, I don't know if embarrassing is the right word, but it would be a huge violation of what I thought that the, the, you know, the, the whole reason that I was using this platform was for. So just a good reminder, everybody. Um, to, uh, to, you know, to be cautious and also keep stuff that's private, um, you know, private for a reason. And if it shouldn't be there at all, maybe put it somewhere else. All right, moving on now to the FTC trying to do some good for all of us. The FTC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking for a new click to cancel rule, which would require businesses to make it as easy to cancel a subscription as it is to start it. We all know it's real easy to start a subscription, but not always easy to go the other way. So the rule would require that the steps to cancel that subscription be the same as those needed to sign up for one. So there are three steps to sign up, there are three steps to cancel. The proposed rule would also require businesses to ask consumers if they wanna hear additional offers when they try to cancel a subscription. Businesses would also have to get explicit user consent to pay for a service remind them of automatic renewals, and then spell out how long a free trial will last, because often that information is obfuscated. Right, Rich? Yeah. And uh, this click to cancel rule would also amend and update the existing negative option rule that's been on the books for a while. In the past, this generally applies to the idea like, you know, a business sends you something in the mail, a product that they're selling, and then they charge you if you don't send it back within like an extremely short window. Pretty scammy stuff. So, th you know, th this is it. That was a known problem. And they're seeing this uh, updating this rule as, uh, you know, kind of the modern incarnation of it. The FTC will release the rule soon for public comment but before you get your hopes up too much just a reminder the ftc still has not had a fifth commissioner confirmed by the senate meaning there's always the possibility this could get stuck in a 2-2 partisan lock we've seen other things in the ftc get stalled for similar reasons uh trisha i uh i have to assume you've been through something like this before <laughs> i think everyone has <laughs> i mean i i would love to know if this cancel subscription also applies to email subscriptions that we all somehow get signed up for 50 million of, and then it, you can't find the same little idea. Yeah. unsubscribe. It is the same idea. I definitely, I'm not gonna um, mention the specific service, but there was like a VR workout service that I was a big fan of for a little while. And when I decided I wanted to cancel my subscription, I had to send at least 15 different emails to places to find where to go to cancel the subscription. It was, they were very kind and refunded me the months it took me to go through that process that I didn't use the service. Um, but I mean, what a pain in the tush. Wouldn't we all like to get our time back? I think this would be lovely if it passed, but I know I'm just in the same boat as you guys. We can all be cautiously optimistic, but don't make any assumptions that anything will pass until it's a real thing. 
I like the idea that at least the conversation is getting brought back up. Yeah, it might stall in the Senate. Yeah, you know, let's 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 hope that the Federal Trade Commission can make it work because it's definitely hitting some nerves. Uh, I was trying to think of when was the last time I went through something like this. You know, usually these days, and you mentioned VR workouts, <laughs> Trisha. I can probably guess which one it is, but you know, whatever. Um, m for the most part, I will set myself little like calendar reminders, like make sure that you, you know, uh, you know, uh, drop out of Fitbit Premium before you get, you know, uh, uh, charged again for another year. But that's not the company doing anything wrong. I feel like, in general, especially in app stores, there's a little bit more of a streamlined effort here. However. People bring up things like workouts, gym memberships, the worst. I once paid for a gym membership for like a year in college when I did not live anywhere near the gym that I would physically go to in my previous hometown because I had to go in in person and then it was like there was some sort of form I had to fill out and you know I wasn't there anyway and then when I went it was confusing and you know it was all designed to just keep charging me another couple months before I you know got wise and figured it out a lot of people have been through this and it happens all the time and businesses should not be able to do this sort of thing and you know it's not it's not as if the uh, canceling a subscription process has to be that complicated no of course not it's because the company hopes that you just give up and say ah maybe I don't care that much I, I would argue that there is enough competition in many of the the things that this would be impacted by. Physical gym memberships is different. Like physically having to go into a location, that's an accessibility issue for a lot of people. Certainly not yeah. disclosing the length of like a subscription, a free a free trial or something like that. I, 100% for that. But I, I will say for the subscription process, I feel like there is enough competition. We're talking about streaming services. We're talking about, you know, subscription boxes or, or a lot of different online services where there is not one it's not like there's subscription dot go that's dominating everything right that that is a that is a customer dif like a customer experience differentiation point for these businesses i know i i f frequent businesses and uh, subscription services like youtube tv i prefer to use youtube tv because it's super easy to cancel when i don't need it anymore because mm -hmm. i kind of hop on and off and it's literally three clicks and they're not trying to get me back with a, you can pay less for six months and stuff like that. I, I can see the argument of why some people would say that particular requirement perhaps seems a little onerous. Again, when it gets to the point of consumer confusion, when it gets to the point of accessibility, where, where it, it, is, it is hard for some people to be able to do this, I 100% agree with that. But I also think that there is a point here of this could help businesses differentiate by offering a smooth on and off ramp for these <laughs> yes. services, especially as we're kind of getting drowned in a lot of, uh, you know, uh, subscription fatigue, as it were. It's like, we want you, but if you want to go, we'll let you go. <laughs> we'll let, and I, I appreciate that. That will make me come back to you. I will 100% tell you that. If you make it easy to go, I will be back. Well, and some of this, too, isn't really about businesses necessarily trying to trick you into paying more money. That definitely does happen. But um, the way that this proposal is laid out, it's like, if I'm able to get on the phone with Verizon, you know, that's my mobile um uh, carrier and you know add on something to my account it should be just as easy for me to get on the phone with Verizon and in that single phone call because they'd love to take my money to say I don't want that anymore and I can think of numerous times and I'm not this is not about Verizon specifically but them saying yeah no totally fine but here's what you have to do in order to do that this <laughs> would do this is. would take those extra steps out because they know that you know we, again like you said rich we have fatigue well, you might have uh, ideas about uh, subscriptions and how that should be better to cancel or anything else, and we would love for you to talk about those in our Discord. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. The Game Developers Conference is happening all this week in San Francisco, California. New technologies and new ideas that come from that even could easily find its way into your next gaming experience. Companies that are there certainly hope so. Trisha, you've been keeping an eye on this year's GDC. There's always a lot of announcements and some fluff. So let's break down all the big news you feel like event gamers should know about. 
Yeah, GDC News is always a funny thing because the Game Developers Con uh, Conference is exactly that. It's for game developers. So what actually makes it to kind of the consumer gamer level it sometimes is a lot and sometimes is a little. But mostly from what I've been seeing this year, a lot of the GDC um, discussion has been around AI. Lots and lots of AI. So from Ubisoft's new Ghostwriter, which I know you guys talked about a little bit yesterday, um, but also Unity and others have come out talking about these AI tools that can help in the game development process. Now, anytime you have a headline that's coming out like Ghostwriter can automatically generate video game dialogue, I think there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction online. Um, and there was, certainly was. Yesterday on Twitter, I saw lots of people in my feed talking about, like, this is going to take jobs away from game development. This is actually a bad thing, um, but it's really interesting to follow the discourse. So, for example, when Unity was talking about this type of AI being used in the game development process, it did seem like they were talking about taking jobs away. Um, there's a quote from Unity CEO John Ricitelliello that said, in every video game in history, the dialogue was written by somebody, but now that you can do, now with what you can do with generative AI is give these characters motivation, personality, and objectives, and then they can spawn dialogue that doesn't require a writer. Whereas Ubisoft's Ghostwriter tool, they specifically were talking about how this would kind of do the first draft of the writing for background characters. So this would be helping out in the chatter that NPCs say as you're you know, running through a town or something like that. Now, for me, if this is really just the first draft and you're still employing writers to go through and edit and put the final touches on things, then it frees up those writers to focus on the more heavy lifting of the game development and game writing process. Um, so I, I could see that as a usable tool. Now, can we get into the discussion, and, and Sarah and Rich, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this, can we get into the discussion of will AI, whether it be in smart home or uh, game development or wherever it happens to land, go so far as to give us like a singularity where the AI learns from itself and then is suddenly taking over humans altogether. We could certainly go down that road, but I do think at this point, at least, we're a ways away from that. Do you disagree? Yeah, and, and I, I think the idea that this is going to take away jobs, like, these AI writing tools are already out there. So if Ubisoft isn't doing this, their writers are going to be working in apps that are going to have this. If they don't already have it already with, you know, if they're not already using the Bing chatbot or chat GPT, Microsoft Word is going to have it in, a, in a, you know, two months or, or whenever Microsoft rolls that out. So it's like, th I, I think the idea has to be, it doesn't have to be, but I, I think the uh, how I'm seeing it is these tools are coming. It's a matter of if you're going to embrace it on a corporate level, or you're going to just let your writers do it and they're just not, they're just, oh, uh, you know, uh, Rich is churning out way more copy than he used to be. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, great bonus for him or something, you know. <laughs> so, like, like yes. I, I have no problem with it. And I could see for, for things like, uh, you know, for uh, like MMORPGs and stuff like that, that where you have like just so many characters and some of which might be algorithmically generated to be able to like very quickly come up with reasonably compelling like npc background chatter stuff like if you want to go in or i could even see like all the lore stuff like when you you pull the book off the shelf and you know you're looking through that i'm thinking like Baldur's gate or something like that like there's a lot of that that i feel like we could bust out a first draft of that pretty easy to have some compelling interesting if you want to go deep but you know doesn't you know you, you could potentially get more out of your more meaningful content out of your writers for sure I was thinking about, uh, and, you know, I won't belabor this point, but, you know, the, the whole idea of machine learning, you know, it's like, oh, the machines are going to get too smart. Remember when Gmail gave you sort of like, let's predict the end of your sentence based on how many of these sentences already end? And I remember, you know, some of my friends being like, don't want it. It's a tool you can turn off. All good. You know, and this is a personal thing. But uh, I actually find this sort of thing extremely helpful. It was weird at first. And we're talking about something on a larger scale than that. But just remember that there was a time where that was like, oh, this is scary. Oh, no. Now the <laughs> robots are talking. And now it's kind of like it's a tool that can be employed to save you time, you know, and maybe a few brain cells. I agree. I mean, as long as it's not stealing from other artists' work to generate the final product of whatever it's generating, yeah. um, I do go. think that AI tools can be very useful. But Trisha, we can't get you out of here before talking about all the stuff Epic announced, Epic Games announced uh, at GDC. I mean, it was like like trying to keep track of it just was, was drowning. Well, I guess what was the biggest or kind of the biggest items for you? I mean, a lot of like very ambitious stuff from them, right? 
Yep, a uh, new Unreal Engine uh, demo and editing tools. And Epic announced, and for me, as someone who creates a lot of content online, uh, same as you guys with Good Day Internet and Daily Tech <laughs> News Show, you know, it's Epic's creator economy is going to get a revamp. And they're calling it Epic's creator economy 2.0, where they're talking about giving 40% rev share to those who create games in Fortnite, um, if you know people love their islands. So things like island popularity, engagement, retention, and attracting new players will all supposedly play into how much of a payout that creators can get from this. But I mean, previously, I feel like in games like this, you would see monetization loops or um, gating type items, more mm -hmm. creative ways for people who are building in these spaces to monetize their work. So to have Epic come out and say, hey, we're, we, you don't need to do any of that stuff anymore. We're just going to, if you make something people love in our game, we're going to do a 40% rev share. Um, I think... That's pretty cool. They uh, launched a creator portal, um, creator.fortnite.com, I believe, uh, to help people create new things. And in helping users to create more for that online space, I think it leads into a really interesting conversation about could Fortnite, could Roblox, could, you know, user generated content public online spaces like this become the vision of what everyone talked about the metaverse being sarah do you uh do you have any thoughts on <laughs> roblox or fortnite being the actual future of what the metaverse is well um i will go ahead and channel tom Merritt uh right now who's not on the show with us today saying roblox is the metaverse you guys it already exists it's well right there People live in there. You are buying and selling goods. You're building things. You're making friends. Um, we we definitely have metaverses. Metaverse I. I don't know whatever the <laughs> plural is. Uh, we, it, it, it already exists. And I think anytime you get into you know Meta saying something, Meta the company saying something like, "Well, Horizon Worlds, it's the new metaverse." People go, "Eh, it's not really the one I want." Also, I have other <laughs> options, or I don't want it at all. So, you know, it, we're still in early days here, but, but yeah, they exist and are thriving. Well, and I think it's interesting, at, uh, with an interview with The Verge at GDC, uh, Tim Sweeney, Epic's uh, CEO, uh, I was asked to define the metaverse. I thought it was just really interesting. He said, it's just an online social entertainment experience in a real-time 3D setting. You and your friends going around, having fun together in a 3D world. And I feel like that's the most concise I like idea. <laughs> I, I'm sure their plans for the metaverse are much more expansive than that. But like to say, like, OK, here is someone that's making a metaverse like thing, giving me a definition of the metaverse. I appreciate that, Tim. Yeah, yeah I mean, Tim Sweeney. Yeah. Yeah. It, I don't know, Sarah, if you read that interview, but in that same interview that you're referring to, Rich, Tim Sweeney had also said that really the future of the metaverse could be standardizing, um, you know, the protocols between the different engines that people are created in, creating in. So if you create something that's meant to be in Fortnite, you could also easily put it in Roblox. And then really mm -hmm. we could have some kind of overview vision of the metaverse if, like, say, the metaverse is to the internet what Roblox and Fortnite are to different sites on the internet, if you will. It, it, it is interesting that that conversation got me thinking of, like, okay, well, who's going to blink first? Because someone's going to have to 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 open the, <laughs> the proprietary standard and proprietary standard one of them has to go open standard first. So I, I, I think that's that's an interesting question as to, you know, because he, he compared it to like the early days of the Internet with multiple incompatible systems, even just like Prodigy AOL and stuff like that. And and eventually that coming together to an open standard. There's a, I feel like there's a lot more money at this point in the metaverse than there was in AOL and Prodigy back in the day. So I'm skeptical that we will see that. There's also just, there's so much emphasis being put on, it's you, you know, you create your likeness, and then you're in a virtual world, but you're you. And that's fine, uh, particularly if we were all in some sort of a metaverse doing the show right now, which is entirely possible in the future at some point. But, uh, you know, the idea of, of Rich and Trisha and I and Roger and Amos and Joe and Tom just getting on, you know, let's, let's play a game together. Let's do some multiplayer thing. That is a metaverse of sorts. I mean, sure, it's not as as forward thinking as this whole 3D option is, but I don't know how different it really is. You and, and your friends we need to going around it. having fun together in a 3D world. There you go. 
That's it. <laughs> um, well, Trisha, thank you for bringing bringing the knowledge on GDC. I know you've been following this closely this week, and we really appreciate it. You know, we also appreciate nostalgia apps. <laughs> In fact, this one this one is near and dear to my heart. And Rich, I know for a fact that you know it as well. Millennial nostalgia seems like it might be reaching. I don't know, a couple decades back now, because the photo filter app Hipstamatic relaunched on the iOS App Store, offering a more simplified look and an actual photo sharing network. Not totally like Instagram, but a little bit more community focused, letting you publish to a chronological feed, limiting followers to 99, so it's got to be your best friends, including camera filters and not showing ads. Co-founder Lucas Buick said that it will support the app through a community membership program. Didn't really offer specifics beyond that, but the last time I, I, I've had Hipstamatic uh, on... <laughs> All the iPhones I've ever had, I believe. Um, and a couple of years ago, it got a little complicated. There was a new app, but you would have to pay for it. But you could like still hang out with the legacy app. So that's what I've been doing. So I'm hoping I can revisit this whole thing because I really enjoyed Hipstamatic back in the day. Yes, uh, hopefully they can unify the hipstamatic uh, app universe into a uh, <laughs> into a cohesive uh, vision. Like, perhaps. If, by the way, if you're like hipstamatic, what is that? If you never used it, this is this is pre Instagram. I mean, it was uh, the. <laughs> I hate to use the word hipster because what does that even mean anymore? But it was a very creative way to use a variety of hip filters. Yeah, it, over it your leaned photos. into the filters hard. Yeah. 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 So. A lot of those private uh, photo albums of mine on Flickr. <laughs> Hipstamatic. <laughs> um, well, Trisha, whether or not you use photo filters, no matter to us, we're just glad to have you. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work because you're a very busy gal. Thank you so much. Uh, this was so much fun. I am an Android user, so I never got my hipstamatic on. But if you want to find any of my non-filtered content, uh, you can do that on twitch.tv slash Trisha Hirschberger or uh, Instagram, Twitter, any of the other places at that girl Trish with no I in the girl, just that G-R-L Trish. And that's it. Come come say hi. <laughs> do do say hi to Trish because, I mean, one of the hardest working uh, working people in the biz. Just say that right now. So we're so glad that you took some time to hang out with us today. Always fun. We also have a special thank you. We're going to thank Eklund, HockeyBuzz.com. Eklund, way to go there, putting your uh, uh, domain <laughs> in your Patreon. Uh, but you know what? That's what you signed up as. So that's how we're going to thank you. You're one of our top lifetime supporters and we like you just the way you are. Thank you for all the years of support, Eklund. And remember, patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to be talking about how games are making money in the Meta's Quest Store and the GDC Awards uh, with Trisha. So looking forward to that. Uh, so stick around. We'll be starting right after the show. Indeed. But just a reminder, you can catch this show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow with Lamar Wilson joining us. What will he unbox? Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>